because we live through the saving life of Christ. You know, a lot of people think that being good will get them into heaven. I want to tell you something very seriously. That all those people are being good for nothing. Because only those who are washed in the blood of Christ will ever enter into the presence of a thrice holy God for all eternity. Twenty-one. it says, God made him, that's Jesus, to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You get that? Jesus was placarded as a sin bearer up on that cross. And way back in Numbers 21, many hundreds of years before, God was demonstrating this type of Christ. And what was amazing was he never removed the snakes, but he depowered the snakes. Now I'm still in the presence of sin. But sin has been dealt with when Jesus Christ tete testi, and that is the Greek word for paid in full. It is finished. Yes, devil and every devil in hell and above. Know this, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Jesus Christ has won the victory. from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. We're going to pray in a minute and I want to thank Wendy for reading. And, and Don, you, you, you just led beautifully this morning in the communion. Thank you. It was simple and it was to the point, but it was, but it was a blessing uh, as we shared. Now, in this thing here, I have a funny looking power board. Well, it looks like a power board. Um, and I didn't bring this along to try to be technical. I, I want to illustrate... Um, what it's all about. Now, you know the topic this morning 
is about the dynamic power of the cross. And we just read um, through Wendy's um, leading, we, we just read concerning this um, story uh, back in Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9, about how um, God demonstrated his power in the wilderness and what Wendy read to us is an Old Testament type but reality of the cross of Christ. Now I used to read through that passage as a younger Christian and I used to say, this is a crazy idea. These people were bitten by snakes and they were dying and they said, we've sinned and we've spoken against God and we've spoken against you, Moses. And now pray to God to take away the snakes. I want you to get this this morning. God never took away the snakes. Okay? But he, he won the victory over the venom and the effect of the snakes. Okay? Now, I want you to see this. And, 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 and so he prayed and the Lord didn't say, I'm going to get rid of the snakes. The Lord said, I want you to get some metal, probably brass or something, and make the shape of a serpent and put it up on this pole. And I thought, how can that be an answer to the very thing? Well, over in, um, and we're going to look at some other cross-references, but over in um, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 5 and verse 21, it says, God made him, that's Jesus, to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You get that? Jesus was placarded as a sin bearer up on that cross. And away back in Numbers 21, many hundreds of years before, God was demonstrating this type of Christ. And what was amazing was he never removed the snakes, but he depowered the snake. We will always be in the presence of sin in this world. To our last breath, we'll be in the presence of sin. But I want you to get this this morning because one author wrote a book about the saving life of Christ. The saving life of Christ. And you know, we're kept by the power of God through faith. Now, there's a wonderful story. And we're going to illustrate it. But let me give you my illustration here. When we lived south of the river, uh, every now and then, the the electricity, the SEC, isn't it, um, would would want to renew a pole and it would take a whole day of power away and, you you know, everything in the fridge goes soft and all that stuff. So, I went out and I bought, I bought a um, a two point seven um, power um, plant that is driven by a petrol engine, and so we could have light of our own. And this um, little power plant, I still got it. And, and guess what I'll make you jealous? It's got a key start on it. So I just hit the key and start. And two power points on the side. But it's a danger to run your computer and your laptop and your TV and, your, and other electrical things like that unless you have the assurance that there's not going to be a surge that's going to burn out something in the machine. So after I bought the plant, I went and got this thing, okay? And 
This has eight outlets. I, I get my uh, portable engine, electric plant, out of the shed, start it with the key when the battery's not flat, and I put that into the lead coming from the motor, this end here. But every one of those power points, all those eight power, uh, three point power points, and including those three for another sort of a, a lead, all that power is purified before it gets to my computer or to the TV or whatever it might be. And so your three point plug goes in like that. Okay, and I've got eight of them. So just about everything I want to run in my house, I have some other leads for, and we, we let them uh, just start the engine, and I've got power, and I've got lighting. Um, and so we do have an occasional blackout, especially when you get a a lightning strike next door to your house and it was a big one and it was so bad I went out to the letterbox and I uh, I was shaking when I got back inside. My wife thought she'd see me laying on the driveway dead. It was so close and so powerful and I was shaking all over like a leaf. Okay? So um It, this strike was so powerful that um, the house next door even had a three-point plug blown out of the wall. Our computer was totally destroyed. And um, there was uh, people that had every globe blown in their house over the road. And everything went black. And the department were many days fixing up oodles of houses in Kingsley. But I had power. I just turned the key and everything worked. I don't know how I made you jealous. <laughs> Big pardon? Um, I'll just have to check up. I've forgotten the address. Runs the fridge, runs everything. Okay? Uh, to get one of those motors, it's about a thousand bucks. So if you've got two thousand, you can get me a spare one. Okay. Let me tell you, it's been a great help. And one time when we were south of the river, the Gosnells Church was uh, quite a large seating church. But um, right in the middle of having a funeral on a cloudy day, there was a blackout. And um, I raced home. I, I had finished ministering at that church, but I went to the funeral because I knew the people. And I raced home and I grabbed my motor and I grabbed a long lead and I got a 500 watt light on the end of it and I lit the whole stage up. How's that? I th m pardon me taking this time to tell you this, I think that every church should have an automatic plan that when the power goes off, the lights come on. All filtered stuff, Clive, to go through that machinery where you were sitting. So this morning... We're going to pray, and then we're going to seek to um, to unpack this message. Father, we thank you for the lovely songs we've sang. We thank you that we have again remembered our Lord as he was placarded up on that Roman cross like a criminal 
not for sins that he had committed, but for every one of us. Thank you, Lord, so much. Help us to understand this message this morning. And please touch our hearts. Because one day, only those who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus will live forever in the glory and the peace and the wonder of our God's heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And all the people said? Amen. Amen. Thank you, um, Wendy, for reading for us. So, so much for power plants and all that stuff. Um, and a little bit of technology there. Now, if we apply, if we apply uh, to the spiritual side of our lives and the, the divinity of our God, that is the divine person who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, if we apply this whole principle of power and to the divine side, I read in my Bible that there's a provision for every Christian, every born-again, regenerate Christian who's been filled with the Holy Spirit. There's power to live the Christian life. There's power to worship. There's power to witness. And I've written down some of these, the, those eight power outlets here on my thoughts for this morning. Uh, the one we're going to really major on is the dynamic power of the cross. But when we think about the issue of power, we think about the power of God in creation. A and in Romans chapter 1, it says this, it says this, for since the creation of the world God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that man is without excuse. Now, when the announcements were read this morning and we said we're going to have this first special prayer time on the 1st of April, what, what did you think of? Well, I'll tell you what I thought of. It's April Fool's Day. Okay. Uh, but let me say this. According to my Bible, in Psalm 14 and in Psalm 53, it says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So I don't want to insult anybody or put anybody down because God loves all of us, whether we're believers or not. But I, I, I reckon that every atheist was born on the 1st of April, according to the Bible. Did you get it? You're supposed to say, I've got it. Did you get it? Then there is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the power of the Holy Spirit, the invisible power. And that's the amazing thing uh, uh, about electrical storms. They're so powerful, but they only become visible when they hit the earth. And the divine power that's within a Christian is not a show of a flesh church or a show of religiosity or traditions and all that sort of thing. It is shown through the life and the look and the deeds and the works of the power of God through the Christian person. And then, of course, wonderful, wonderful in our song this morning, there's the power of the blood. There's the power of the blood, not only to be saved, but to go on being saved. And I've found in my life how many times I've had to go back to the cross and confess my sin and confess my failing and find release immediately because I've said, Lord, unconditionally, I surrender my failing to the cross. 
Now, that's not a, an excuse to sin or to disobey God. It's simply the provision of God. And I'm here in standing in this pulpit today because on two special occasions when bitterness was filling my heart and when anger had done the wrong thing with my life, I immediately went back to that place of the cross and within five minutes I was free. I was forgiven. I was made whole again. Now I'm still in the presence of sin. But sin has been dealt with when Jesus cried, tetatestai, and that is the, the Greek word for paid in full. It is finished. Yes, devil and every devil in hell and above. Know this, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Jesus Christ has won the victory. And then there's power in the Word of God. And then there's power in the resurrection. What did Paul say in Philippians 3 and verse 10? He said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Lord, Brother, thank you for praying as you did this morning and sharing those songs as you did. And as I heard people pray out in the room this morning about the power of God coming down upon this church, about the power of God coming down upon this district and many hearts being touched by the living God. Amen? Amen. Are you excited about it? If you're not, you ought to be. Because when our God moves... And I've seen this happen. I've, I've ministered at camps and been at places where I've seen the power of God come upon people. And the best thing most of them could do was either weep or laugh with the joy of the Lord. And then there is the power of his presence. There's the power of prayer. In Luke chapter 8, I think it is, where it says, and his power was present to heal. You know, I, I want to tell you, while I believe in divine healing, very much so, but one morning at a morning service, I, I, I don't know what I was preaching on even. I can't remember. But as we were having the closing hymn, I sensed the Holy Spirit wanted to do something. And I stopped in the middle of the hymn and I stepped down from this, like, from this pulpit. And I said, if anyone has a need, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to help you. And there was a senior couple there. She was 85 and he was 80. And she'd already had cancer under the arm here and head in for another dose of, uh, have another operation, another biopsy and all that stuff. And she was in a lot of pain. And I just stepped down and we kept singing and this couple came forward and I asked the elders in the church, right there in front of the congregation, to come and lay hands on her and I would pray for her. I want to tell you, a wonderful miracle happened. At that moment, that day, she was totally healed and she knew she was. Okay? She knew she was. Now, sometimes the Lord heals instantly. Sometimes he heals progressively. Sometimes through prayer. You know, we have a friend just lately, she, this, this woman had had cancer three times. Three times. In fact, she went along to a skin specialist and, and he actually found a white melanoma in her body. But recently, she discovered that all in the lower part of her, 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 
her um, bottom and, and her belly. She was riddled with cancer. Again, third time. They don't feel miserable about it. Good well, I'll tell you something. They treated her. She's a Christian. They treated her. We prayed for her. And you know what? Just recently, she went for a, a PET scan, I think you call it. They could not find one dark spot of cancer. Hallelujah. Our God is still in the business of healing. Now, I, I say this to people. Don't be arrogant about healing. God doesn't heal everybody. But we should expect him to. Because of the power of God to heal. And if you read your Bible in the book of John, it tells us, and, and Jesus was constantly, all day, every day at times, he was healing people. And it says there, I believe it's in the... Uh, Second last chapter of John, if all the miracles of Jesus were recorded, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to record all the stories. And we sing, and we say, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now let, now let me say something else. In the book of James, it tells us that if any is sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. I'll say, say this clearly. We encourage all people to pray and pray for one another. And pray for one another if you're sick because we're told to do that. But the Bible states several times that when it comes to the laying on of hands, it's the ministry of the elders of the church. And I think we should do it as the Bible says. It says, it says in another part of the New Testament not to be in a hurry to lay hands on people. So let's be careful about that. I believe that these special anointings and these special callings, the anointing of oil, uh, where I have seen many people healed with the anointing of oil, belongs to the elders and the leadership of the church, firstly, and, 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 and only belongs to them to bring it about or to lead prayer in, on behalf of others. It's not for anybody just to jump in and think they can do this and do that because God has a way of working. Now this morning we're coming specifically to the power of the cross and I want to read to you some quotes by the Apostle Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you, if you haven't got a Bible or, you, or you, you'd rather listen, just listen. But it's in chapter 1 and it's in verse 18. Yeah, sorry, it's in verse 17 of chapter 1 through to verse 18. And this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth, the church that he and his fellow workers had planted. And there was great sin and wickedness in Corinth as there was in most of those cities where Paul went. Uh, now Paul didn't even have a tut -tut to, 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 to ride in. He walks. Sometimes he might have got a ride in a chariot or sometimes he went by boat. We know that. But I'll tell you what, he had no electric power plants. He, he had no colour lights. He had no advertising. He just went in the power of the Spirit. I'm going to show you the verse in a minute. He went in the power of God. And when people saw miracles, when people saw transformed lives, brothers and sisters here this morning, I shared this with our elders a couple of days ago, and that is that in this hour in which we live, we've got a lot of things against God. We've got a lot of things against our young people. We've got a lot of things. We've got strongholds against our marriages. We've got all sorts of things trying to tear the church down. Now, this thing that happened in Hillsong, I, I, I don't agree with what happened, but the media talk about it almost every time the news comes on about the failures of, the, of this Hillsong church. Brethren, I'm not... I'm not condoning any of that. 
I'm saying to you this morning that this world wants to find fault with God like those people that complain in the 21st uh, chapter of Numbers. And we have got to, as, as we read in our devotions this morning, it says, wake up, O sleeper, arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Shine on you. Hallelujah. Shine, Jesus, shine. I love that song, man. That's a beautiful song, Shine, Jesus, Shine. The words of it, the, 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 the thrust of it, the joy of it is beautiful. There was a youth camp that I went to when we were in Bible college and I was very inexperienced at, at talking, to, talking in public or anything like that. But in this meeting, I walked up from my unit where we as a married couple were and I walked into this sort of a listen hut and when I walked in there, it was just as if, it's just as if I walked into sort of smoke, sort of like a mist. And I didn't realize when I walked in there at first what it was. You know what it was? It was the presence of God. It was the presence of God. And the meeting proceeded. I remember what I preached when I was preaching on the blind man, John chapter 9. And as I was preaching, the leaders, Christians they were, the leaders of these children from a very rough area of West Adelaide, they were all started breaking down. Now, I was up in the pulpit there, you know, in front of all these people and these young people, and, and, and I started to get the emotional jettas, and I was battling not to break down. I'll tell you what. There was a little girl there, and she was nine years of age. She come from a family from the Eastern Bloc, probably Orthodox or Catholic or whatever. And she looked up at a leader, and I, I happened to quote from that passage where it says, and Jesus himself passed by. And she looked up at her leader, and she said, he's just come in. The presence of God was so powerful that even a child could say, he's just come into my life. Now I want to tell you something else. I looked on the faces of the wives and the women folk at that meeting and their faces were shining with angel dust and their eyes were just, I can't, I can't describe them, so wonderful. And the husband said to me the next day, did you see my face, uh, my wife's face last night? I sure did. It was the glory of God shining on people's faces and since I've had that experience I, I want to tell you people something sometimes I have expressions that are, are, are very charismatic like well I'll tell you what I have never spoken tongues in my life or have I ever desired to but I have desired like Paul to, to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And I want to tell you something. Before I come to this pulpit, I spent a lot of time in the word pleading with God that he'll anoint me with the Holy Spirit. So when I preach, I preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and Paul says here in 1 Corinthians where we open to chapter 1, he says this, he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And then he goes on to verse 8, and he says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. And dear Oswald Chambers, Nancy, you you got one of his books, I know that. A devotional book by Oswald Chambers. You know what he says? 
He says every time that we preach the cross in the power of the, uh, in, we, we preach the cross of Christ in the strength of God, he says the power of God moves. And I've found that over the years. And I love preaching on the cross. Although to the world it's an offence. And you know when I used to read that Numbers 21 through and, and, and I saw that God told Moses uh, to, to make this serpent put up on this, on this pole and whoever looks had been bitten by sin and bitten by the snakes, whoever looked would be healed. And they were. And how many people have I known that went along to some of these great crusades where thousands of people responded to Christ and their lives were changed. And, and, and their, their lives were changed to the day they died. And so I've been along to some of those funerals. And their, their, their lives are going to be changed for all eternity. You see, Gamble down here, he was the first man, the first person to come to Christ when the church was started over in Woodville. I tell you what, I know the gamble's been through some trials, but I know his love for the Lord has continued on. And, and, and it says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Christ. And you see, as we know the scriptures, and then in that passage in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and going on to uh, verse 23, it says this. It says, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. Wonderful, wonderful. And then Paul gives this test to me in chapter 2 because, as I said earlier, he, he went out on foot with, with no flashing lights and no great advertising signs and all this, and he, he, he would go first into the synagogue where there was a knowledge of God and then, then sometimes he, he, out of Mars Hill, he'd be just speaking to people about the God who created And this is what he says. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. I wasn't a good orator and he wasn't. But he said, I come in a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest in men's wisdom but in the power of God. You know what amazed me this morning? One of our brothers who prayed out in the back prayer room he prayed concerning the power of God. I came in here and I heard several references to the power of God. And I'd been saying to the Lord for some time, Lord, is this a message you want me to preach at the church this Sunday uh, about the dynamic power of God? And it was all confirmed for me since I come to the church this morning in the Psalms, in prayer. And in many ways, the power of God. Okay. So, the passage that Wendy read to us from Numbers 21 was an Old Testament type of the power of the cross. And in John, 
in the book of John and chapter 3, when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, okay, and Jesus uh, spoke to him about being born again, and, and he says, how can this happen? How can this happen? And he asked several questions. Can I go back from my mother's womb and be born again? Okay. And then when he gets to verse 14, pardon me, I'll just wet my whistle a bit. When we get down to verse 14 in chapter 3, he says this. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And then I love these, these verses. He says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. And he goes on, listen to this place. He says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to the light for fear that his deeds may be exposed. And I've talked to people. I've heard testimonies again and again where people were too frightened to come, too proud to come, because they thought they, they could make themselves good enough. I want to tell you, there, there was no way that one of those people were bitten by the snake in the desert could save themselves or change their lives. They had to look by faith to the cross. If you look, you'll live. It's the look of faith. It's not the amount of time you've been to church. It's not the amount of time you've done good deeds. God is God's for all good works, be sure. But it's this look of faith to the provision that God has made for each one of us that will give us Victory over the power of sin and over Satan and over the flesh because we live through the saving life of Christ. You know, a lot of people think that being good will get them into heaven. I want to tell you something very seriously. That all those people are being good for nothing. Because only those who are washed in the blood of Christ will ever enter into the presence of a thrice holy God for all eternity. There's power in the blood. There's dynamic power in the cross of Christ. And millions of people around this globe have been saved and changed forever when they've looked at to the cross. Did you know that Karl Marx, I don't agree with Karl Marx, he was one of the founders of communism and he, he, he was not a godly man, but he said, he said this, he said religion is the opium like a drug, he said re religion is the opium of the people. But we don't stand in this pulpit or any pulpit and preach religion. We preach Christ and him crucified, risen, ascended and coming again. Amen. Hallelujah. Folks, we're coming to the end of this address this morning. But just as those people who had 
cursed Moses and cursed God were overcome by the snakes. Okay. And the only way they could be saved was just all they had to do was humble themselves and believe and look to God's provision in the desert for them. Let's bow for prayer. Now, our brother um, Stuart had done a wonderful design that was going to be in our bulletin. I hope it goes in next week, Stuart. And somehow or other we never got the bulletin, but I hope that design he did of, of the snake and the cross will be shown in some of our material. Only Christ's blood and only his death and only his risen life will ever change your life and my life and the lives of millions of people and this Australia every eight days, sorry, every seven days, there's eight people that take their lives in suicide in this fair country of ours. And men, mental health is deteriorating. And we have a rich country, but there's 80,000 people who are homeless. And just this last week on the news, it was reported that I think it was 170 people had died on our streets under a dirty rug. Lord, help us to repent and help us to seek you with the whole heart and that your power will be revealed in this land of ours and in this church of ours and in our lives and in our marriages and in our families and in our children. Lord, we need you. Saviour, you said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And I hope this morning, dear Saviour, we've lifted you up. Father, you do your work. It's not by might, it's not by power, but, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. These mountains in our lives and in our community will be removed. God bless you all.